good morning everybody so today we will discuss on adaptation and functional morphology so as you learn from the previous classes that the central idea or the main concept is that whenever a organism lives in an environment successfully that means that particular organism is well adapted with that environment that means he or she is a, is become a good fit with that particular environment such that he or she or that particular organism is able to survive in that environment and with time they will reproduce time after time so this is the main fundamental concept of darwin natural selection theory now the term adaptation which comes from the term adapt it implies movement towards an appropriate or apt relationship to environmental demands that means whatever the demand of the environment that means to survive in a particular uh, environmental condition the requirement for survival in that condition if we can accommodate it within our body structure within our body morphology then it is called adaptation say for example in extremely cold regions so the organisms such that the bear the dogs in the polar regions where it is temperature is uh, always less than 0 degree centigrade so that in extreme cold uh, situation they did not have any sweater like that like uh, what we have so therefore to prevent from that extreme cold situation to survive in that extreme cold situation the animals of the polar condition they formed large furs large body hairs so that the body temperature of that particular organism is maintained so that particular change in morphology that particular appearance in certain morphology for fulfilling the demand of the environmental condition is known as adaptation and if an organism can do that successfully we call them the organism is well adapted and according to darwin that particular organism is naturally selected and with time they will reproduce and pass this inherit, inherited character to the next generation now darwin proposed the evolutionary idea far before 170 uh, years ago actually actually this years is on the calculation of uh, this year Benton from Benton Harper 2009. So, if you consider it from the present day, it was about 165 years ago. So, in 1859. So, Darwin's evolutionary proposal, evolutionary idea was proposed uh, about 165 years ago from the present day. And throughout this 165 million years, there are various modifications, uh, various um, talks in favor and in opposing to Darwin's natural selection concept but till date no one has completely falsified Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection so there are many modifications happened and as I told in our previous classes that nowadays it is a new group evolved which is called neo darwinist and the theory is called neo darwinian theory but still no one has falsified darwin's evolutionary theory of natural selection now according to darwin adaptation 
is the good fit of organisms to their environment as we already discussed so adaptation is the process by which organisms provide better and better solution to certain problems which imposed by the environment so in an environment where an organism lives somehow there creates a problem that means environment is imposing a problem to an organism and different kinds of organisms solve the same problem in their own way so some organism if suppose in the polar condition a human being and a bear is put there so as a human being we did not need to produce or we did not need to create large fats large body hairs we take some several blankets uh, several winter clothes and protect ourselves from that extreme cold situation but the bear the if they want to survive in those situation they must produce they must form large body hairs so that they can be protected from that extreme cold condition so the same problem problem is the cold situation and it is solved by different organisms in different possible way different uh, solutions better and better solutions are found by different group of organisms for the same problem so that they can fit with that particular environment so that they can be adapted to that particular environment so this is the main concept this is the main idea proposed by darwin that is whichever organism who is fit for the environment that means they are well adapted and for that the problems imposed by the environment is solved by an organism in a better way in a more easy way and that particular organism is able to find that solution that is why that organism is able to survive in that condition that means organism is adapted now what are the evidences of adaptation the non randomness of biological design if we compare the spectrum of biologically physical morphology that means if we compare the morphospace we found different types of organisms are there but considering the entire morphospace if we plot all the organisms in that three dimensional morphospace we found that only a smaller portion of the morphospace is actually occupied by the organisms that means all the fossils and present organisms if we plot them in the morphospace say for example coming to the example of mollusca so basically mollusca is a conical shell and we all know that uh, within mollusca the main groups are bivalvia gastropoda and cephalopoda so these are the three main groups although there are others also but these are the three main groups within the molluscan forms now the basic cell structure of the mollusca is a conical shell uh, we all know that the hard part or the shell of the mollusca is external so it is mainly used for uh, protection and other purposes but not uh, its function is not similar to the vertebrate uh, hard parts anyway so the basic structure is a conical shell as you can see in this picture and this conical shell you can see one end is closed it's tapering pointed and the other end there is an opening this opening of the molluscan cell is known as aperture that is the growing part so 
after this is the aperture aperture opening and after some time it will grow in this direction and the aperture shifts here so in this way the conical shell of mollusca will grow uh, now for hypothetical purposes we consider this aperture as a generating curve for hypothetical or mathematical calculation we call this aperture as generating curve now the molluscan shell that is the bivalvia gastropoda or cephalopoda they are looks different from one another and that difference simply happened by coiling and over an axis that is called axis of coiling the conical shell coiled swirled around this axis and with different types of coiling and different growth rate from this basic conical shell they produce different types of molluscan forms that means sometimes it produce bivalvia sometimes it produce gastropoda and sometimes it produce cephalopoda so how it is formed for this we consider three parameters say for example this is your fast generating curve that means the fast early formed shell say for example this one is this the fast early formed shell was this so this is the size of the aperture that is the generating curve and this aperture is shown here so this is the generating curve and this one is the axis now three parameters are taken for producing or for considering the different molluscan shape and sizes first is the hole expansion rate which is symbolized as w hole expansion rate means that after a complete 360 degree rotation around the axis of coiling so after complete 360 degree rotation that means from this direction to this direction so after 180 degree rotation this generating curves comes here another 180 degree rotation this generating curves comes here so after one complete 360 degree rotation the generating curve will be comes here now if you compare the sizes between them so you can see that the size of this generating curve is smaller compared to this one now the proportion of change in size between these two generating curves this this one and this one this is called hole expansion rate that means how much the size of the generating curve increases after a complete 360 degree rotation that is called hole expansion rate second is d second parameter that is distance from the coiling axis say for example here we consider the generating curve as a simple circle so this circle have a center this one now if you measure it has a distance from the axis of coiling okay now again after one complete 360 degree coiling we measure the distance of the center of the circle from the axis of coiling so the change in distance between these two generating curves after one complete 360 degree uh, rotation that is the d that is distance from coiling axis so again if you consider one certain point within the generating curve that point may be your uh, center of the circle that point may be this point also that is the axis towards the axis close point nearest point point from the axis of the generating curve that is the nearest point of generating curve from the axis if you consider this point so the thing the measurement will be same 
that is the distance from the axis of coiling so the difference between the distance from the axis of coiling after one complete 360 degree rotation that is denoted as d and the last one is called t that is called translation rate that means the change in position of the generating curve along the vertical axis after one 360 degree rotation so this is your t that is after one 360 degree rotation one complete 360 rotation the generating curves comes here so the shifting of the generating curve after the 360 rotation will be of this much amount so this is your t so together considering with these three characters these three parameters that is whole expansion rate which is the expansion of the size of the aperture or generating curve after a complete 360 degree rotation second is the distance from the axis of coiling that is the change in distance of certain reference point over the generating curve after the complete 360 degree rotation and third is the translation rate which is the distance covered along the vertical axis of coiling after its complete 360 degree rotation so these are the three parameters and depending on various values of these parameters we get different types of Moluscan cells now this was first proposed by rop so these are also known as ropian parameters now how they will produce on the variation of these three parameters how different Moluscan cells are produced here you can see in the y axis it is denoted as uh, t that is translation rate in this axis it is whole expansion rate or w and in this axis it is d that is the distance from the axis of coiling so it's basically a three dimensional figure now first look at this direction that is when our t is zero that means there will no translation along the vertical axis but with a complete 360 degree rotation distance from the axis of coiling is gradually increasing so if you consider the previous figure my first if i my first generating curve will be here this will be my center if there is no t so after one 360 degree rotation the uh, generating curve will not shift in this around this vertical axis so after one 360 rotation if t is zero the generating curve will be there uh, if you consider 180 degree rotation generating curve will be there after 360 degree it is here another 180 it will be here another 180 it will be here so after every 360 degree starting from this position you will get the curve in a single plane if you connect these center point central points they will lie on a straight line so all the generating curves lie side by side you can see that this one is the axis of coiling and you can see in both sides of the axis of coiling you can find the generating curves you can find generating curves so this you can see that the distance from the axis of coiling as we move towards this axis is gradually increasing say for example here the distance is this much amount here the distance is this much amount so the distance is gradually increasing but one important thing is here distance from the axis of coiling is increasing d increase t increase 
W we can also see that the size of the generating curve also increase but T is about 0 T almost 0 there will be no translation so this type of uh, shell parameters variation produce cephalopoda that is a plenty spiral form restricted within a plane within a single horizontal plane so that produce cephalopoda now coming to this this tradition this vertical axis here you can see that with 180 degree or complete 360 degree rotation you can see in this picture this one is the earlier generating curve and after 360 rotation this comes here so that means d increasing distance from the axis of coiling increasing w is also increasing hold expansion rate also increase and the whole the generating curves they will shift along the along this axis after one complete 360 degree rotation so t is also increasing so that means along this axis all these three parameters will change and that will produce gastropoda gastropoda so two types of molluscan cell forms are found by the variation of these two parameters the third type of molluscan forms here the change is mainly observed in w that is hold expansion rate and in case of bivalvia we are only considering 180 degree rotation because a bivalvia shell never completely done a 360 degree rotation so initially my generating curve is here in some uh, condition after 180 degree rotation you can see the change in size of the generating curve and this change is so huge very huge hole expansion is observed in bivalvia you can also see here and this only happened with a 180 degree rotation only bivalvia cell never goes or never complete a 360 degree rotation they simply after 180 degree rotation their size of the generating curve increases in a much much higher rate and it produces this one this much size and along with the extremely high hold expansion rate there may or may not be t so hold expansion rate is extremely high extremely high t may or may not be there translation may or may not may or may not and d d have some values that means the uh, generating curves shifted some distance from the axis of coiling so this variation of these three parameters will produce a different types of molluscan shell that is known as bivalvia so from this diagram you can see that the simple variation of these three parameters these three ropian parameters hold expansion rate distance from the axis of coiling and translation rate these three parameters with their variation in 
size and shape after a complete 360 degree rotation they sometimes produce bivalvia in case of bivalvia although the uh, rotation around the axis is 180 degree so uh, they will produce bivalvia sometimes they produce cephalopoda and sometimes they produce gastropoda now if we look at the morphospace so here the same uh, picture the previous one is shown in a cubic shape that is in plotting the three uh, parameters ropian parameters along the three axis of a cube here you can see in this axis it is d distance from the axis of coiling in this axis it is t translation rate and in this vertical axis it is w whole expansion rate so you can see together the variation of these three axes sometimes it is produced cephalopoda sometimes it forms gastropoda uh, sorry this one is um, you know, sometimes it forms bivalvia sorry this one is bivalvia and sometimes it produce um, gastropoda so, now together if you consider these three parameters and plot all the molluscan cell forms considering the fossil record as well as the present day fossil record plot them in this morphospace in this three dimensional morphospace of w d and t we can see that although these different varieties of molluscan cell forms are possible within this cubic morphospace but originally after plotting all the fossil and present day molluscan cells we found that they are only considering they are only located in a very restricted or very narrow area you can see that all the bival forms are restricted to this portion all the gastropod forms are restricted to this portion all the plane spiral forms cephalopods are restricted to this portion even the brachiopods another type of organism they are also explained with the help of these ropian parameters and they are also plotted or they are also restricted within this portion so you can see most of the portion of this morphospace of this cube remains vacant throughout the entire journey of mollusca if you consider the entire 540 million years history of mollusca cells and plot all the molluscan forms in this cubic space you can see they are only located in a very narrow portion maximum portion of this morphospace of this cube remains vacant now there will be two explanation for this the first thing that still all the molluscan forms did not came with time that means for appearance of these molluscan forms they require much longer time interval so in the next future uh, several million years maybe these forms appeared in the art this will be one explanation the second explanation may be that with time these forms may appeared but they are not the well adapted or naturally selected form so soon after their appearance they are died out that means they are not able to survive the environmental conditions so we did not get them in the fossil record and in the present day also so that means these forms if we consider them that they appear during their journey of during the journey throughout the 540 million year, years time although they appeared if we consider but they are not well adapted so simply they are removed out or simply they become extinct soon after their appearance and they are so less in number so infrequent 
that we did not get them in fossil record also so these are the two possible explanation which explains that the most of the portions of the morpho space is why vacant if you plot the plane spiral form that is the cephalopoda the cephalopoda cell looks like that if you plot the cephalopoda cells in a two dimensional plot so previously we plot all the molluscan cells in a three dimensional uh, plot now we plot all the cephalopod cells in a binary plot in one axis in the vertical axis we plot the whole expansion rate that is w and in uh, x axis we plot the distance from the axis of coil that is d now with the variations of these two parameters we hypothetically draw all the possible forms of cephalopod so starting from the more uh, dense closely coiled form to loosely coiled form here you can see that the this portion is basically separated out from the earlier portion here you can see that it is more compactly packed now if you this is an hypothetical figure of all possible cephalopod forms this one is an hypothetical binary plot now within this binary diagram if we plot all the cephalopod cells all the fossils and present day cephalopod cells then we can found these kinds of contours of these kinds of contours indicating the presence of cephalopod uh, cephalopod cells through time through considering the entire uh, 540 million years this contours indicate that towards the center point they have the maximum abundant or maximum numbers of cephalopod and uh, one thing is that this uh, here we plot only the uh, numbers of genera that means genus numbers are plotted in this diagram so in the center towards the center number of genera increase that means the number of genera in this central portion is maximum and towards this peripheral part number of genera is minimum so the slope is from this side to this side now you can see in this evolutionary diagram binary plot considering the distance from the axis of coiling and whole expansion rate of cephalopod cells that most of the cells they are considering or they consisting around this point and there are only few forms in this peripheral part and the rest of the part these portions are basically vacant there are no forms no fossil forms or present day forms found having this these portions um, param European parameter values and here also these portions so although theoretically all these forms are possible but they are not ecologically stable that means they are not well adapted and it is the nature of the organism that they always try to adapt always try to provide the better solution for the environmental problem imposed to them so thereby an organism always try to move towards the peak towards the more easy solution which they can provide for the same environmental problem so this one is my evolutionary peak for the cephalopod cells that that is why major numbers of cephalopods are concentrated around this peak so this is called evolutionary peak and this portions are called evolutionary valleys so it is the character of an organism of any organisms found in the nature that they always try to well adapt with the environment that means they always try to move towards this evolutionary peak so organisms are never 
remain constantly in these evolutionary valleys, but they always try to move from different directions towards the evolutionary peak, which is the best adaptive condition for that particular ecological condition, for that environmental conditions. So, although in case of cephalopod also in this binary plot, although theoretically in every variation of W and D, these theoretical forms are possible, but in nature, considering all the fossil and present day forms, we did not found them in the record. And this evolutionary peak is for uh, one group of cephalopoda that is known as ammonoid. Ammonite. Similarly, uh, another type of cephalopoda that is known as nautilus, they have their evolutionary peak here. So, for the same environmental problem, ammonite solved them in a way and they formed their evolutionary peak here. Nautilus formed or Nautilus solved the same problem in another way. They have their evolutionary peak here. Spirula, another kind of cephalopod, they have their evolutionary peak here. So, the same problem solved by different kinds of organisms in different way and thereby they have their own evolutionary peak. They have their own best adaptive condition by which uh, they will be best fit to that particular environmental condition. So, if you consider the hypothetical adaptive landscape, if you consider two uh, genetically controlled characters, say it's for example, any two characters are with there. Say for example, in y-axis you put height of an organism and in uh, x-axis you put width of an organism. So, any two measurable characters are plotted in this hypothetical uh, binary plot, hypothetical adaptive landscape. And you may find that organisms are distributed in different positions within this adaptive landscape. Now, for a given time, for a given environmental conditions, there are some adaptive peaks. That means there are some places in this uh, adaptive landscape which in which the organism lived here is best fitted for this environmental condition. Say for the present day environmental condition, which is relatively dry and cold condition persist here. So for these environmental conditions, there are some certain points, certain places within this adaptive landscape where an organism will be best fit. Now, if there are three different organisms are present, say for example, A, B and C. So, you can see that their position in this adaptive landscape, in this uh, space, in this binary plot are different. So, A lies here, B lies here and C lies here. So, according to their different values of these parameters, their positions are determined within this adaptive landscape. Now, as I already told you, every organism try to fit, well fit with that particular environmental conditions. So, all the organisms which lies in the adaptive valleys, they always try to move towards the adaptive peak. So, adaptive valleys are not the best fit situation. It is not the best solution for the organism to sustain in that uh, environmental condition. So, thereby organisms for the same environmental problem that is to survive in the present day, say for example in the present day dry, uh, cold situation, they will try to move towards the adaptive peak which is the best possible solution for the organisms. Now, in this diagram, you can see that there are three adaptive peaks. Now, it is 
upon the organisms and upon other environmental factors, biotic and abiotic factors, which determine that in which direction, in towards which adaptive peak the organism moves. Here you can see that the A organism moves towards this nearest adaptive peak. But although this adaptive peak is also close to organism B, but organism B moves towards this adaptive peak. So the factors, the guiding factors for movement of organism B towards this adaptive peak may be different than the guiding factors which guided organism A to move this peak. So depending on the various biotic and abiotic factors, an organism choose in which adaptive peak they will move. But every organism tries to move towards the adaptive peak. So the position, adaptive position or evolutionary position of an organism is never constant. Organisms always try to move towards an adaptive peak to survive for a prolonged time. Similarly, C organism, they also moving towards this adaptive peak. So for the same environmental condition, these organisms are providing different solutions in different way. And that is why they are moving in different paths in different adaptive peaks. And if they will reach the adaptive peak, then they will be well adapted to that particular environment. But suppose if somehow the environmental landscape changes, that means the environmental condition changes, then the adaptive peak of one environmental condition, the adaptive peak of one time may not be the adaptive peak for other environmental condition, for other time. Say for example, this adaptive peak, this is the well adaptive condition for the present cold dry condition. But during summer when the temperature becomes much hotter and it will be much wet than the present day, then this will not be the adaptive peak, the adaptive peak changes. So with time, with changing environmental condition, the adaptive landscape, that means the adaptive peak and valleys are always changing. So thereby, organisms always try to move, always moving towards the adaptive peak and their journey of moving towards the adaptive peak will never stop because the adaptive peak is not fixed with changing environmental condition, with changing time. Now, as the organisms, as you can see in the previous uh, figure, that organism B and organism C from different adaptive landscape, they are moving towards the same uh, adaptive peak. So that means two different organisms for uh, sustaining the same environmental conditions, they are moving to different way to provide the same solutions and this is known as evolutionary convergence that means say for example for swimming for fast swimming within the aquatic body different group of organisms you can see the swordfish shark dolphin ichthyosaur so you can see shark is a fish Dolphin is a mammal, ichthyosaur is a reptile. So this different group of organisms, mammal, reptiles and uh, fish, they provide the same solution. The, they show all the same streamlined body. Look at their body shape and high lunate tail. They provide the same solution for the same problem, for fast swimming. So that indicates that different group of organisms, they are trying to move towards the same adaptive peak from different positions of the evolutionary landscape. So this is known as evolutionary convergence. That means due to the 
due to providing the same solution due to uh, moving towards the same adaptive peak the organisms try to provide or organisms try to well adapt it and thereby the organisms show almost similar kinds of characters formation or character generation morphological character generation so this is why this process is known as evolutionary convergence another example sometimes convergent evolution is also shown is other organisms also so there are lots of examples say for example bat wings bird wings insect wings so from the general eye you can we all know that the wings of these organisms are used for flying but if you look at the wings more closely you found that insect wings are derived from the exoskeletons the hard part of insect is external whereas bird wings and bat wings they were derived from the four limbs so again you can see that the same function the same flying function is done by this different group of organisms bat insect and birds by modifying different morphological parts different organs for birds it will be the four limbs for insects it will be the exoskeletons so same environmental problem same function is done by different group of organisms to adapt with any particular environmental condition to solve any particular problem in different ways so again the organisms although they solve the problem in different way but they are moving towards the same adaptive peak they are producing same kinds of same looking uh, external morphologies so that they can fly so again an example of evolutionary convergence now there are uh, different ways of evolutionary convergence one famous is known as iterative evolution which is defined the repeated evolution of a specific trait that means specific character or body plan from the same ancestral lineage at different points in time here you can see that the organism a that may be any taxonomic uh, level that may be a species that may be a genus any taxonomic rank uh, say for example a species from a species with time here you can see the along y axis we plot time a from a species with time another species appears that is b after the appearance of b at this point after certain time interval b extinct now again after some time interval from the same ancestral same a species another species appeared that is b dashed and you can see that in x axis we plot actually morphology so the morphology of b dashed and b are almost look same but these two are not same because b dashed is not evolved from b b dashed is evolved from a similarly b is evolved from a at different times again after some time b dashed extinct and from a during this time interval b double dashed appears so you can see almost same morphological characters appeared from the same ancestral species at different time intervals and these three are as they have almost same morphological appearance same looking so that indicates that at different time span at different time evolutionary time the newly evolved species from a say here from the newly evolved species is b here the newly evolved species is b dashed here the newly evolved species is b double dashed so these newly evolved species at different times 
they are solving the same problem in different way and that is why they almost look same like b like b dash like b double dash these three are almost look same so that is why it is said that repeated evolution of a same specific trait from the same ancestral lineage so repeatedly the same evolutionary problem is solved almost by the same way by these three species which comes from the same ancestral uh, lineage ancestral taxonomic group this type of evolution is known as iterative evolution this is also an example of evolutionary convergence so you can see that these three are evolutionary uh, showing convergence of characters in different times for providing the same solution another kind of evolutionary convergence is uh, parallel evolution where two closely related ancestral stocks with minor morphological differences you can see at this point these two species or ancestral stocks or you may say genus or families whatever maybe the taxonomic rank uh, they have very minor morphological differences and with time they undergo a series of evolutionary changes through time and almost look similar so b and c with time undergo similar morphological changes with time and thereby looks almost similar not exactly similar but almost so this is known as parallel evolution why parallel we called that is they undergo a series of same evolutionary changes so this is known as parallel evolution now these two are dif two different ways of evolutionary convergence now evolutionary convergence can be isochronous that means convergence of character can be observed in same time as you can see from the at this point two different species moving in these directions with time and produce b and c at the same time so this is isochronous that means we get b and c at the same time and so they're showing evolutionary convergences and the other type is heterochronous convergence where from this point two different species moving and showing character convergence showing evolution convergence but at different times so this is known as heterochronous convergence so if evolutionary convergence happened in the same time then it is isochronous convergence if it happens at different time then it is heterochronous convergence and it is due to this convergence evolutionary convergence organisms looks similar to an other organism groups although they may or may not be genetically or uh, phylogenetically related to each other so this here you can see this b and b dash are phylogenetically related and they looks similar so it's a common example is also found in our human civilization also you may have heard many times your mother or if your father said you that uh, the face of you is almost very close to your uh, forefather or very close to your grandfather or grandmother also so that means although you are occurred you have in uh, art at different time interval but as the environmental conditions of you and the time of your forefather uh, is almost same so that is why you too may be uh, looks similar but not exactly same so that means you too have almost similar external morphologies this type of evolutionary convergence of morphology and the newly younger developed younger form which looks similar to its ancestral 
or to other kinds of organisms which uh, occurred in the same environmental condition they are known as homeomorph that means homeo means same morph means morphological characters that means they are showing same or similar morphological characters as they live in the same environmental condition now apart from evolutionary convergence there are another type of evolutionary process which is known as evolutionary divergence now in divergence the morphological character will be spreaded out that means different types of morphological characters appeared from the same ancestor and thereby different kinds of species or different kinds of taxonomic groups appeared so here you can see from the same marsupials marsupials are the uh, group of vertebrates from the same marsupials due to evolutionary divergence different characters appear and they will guided these marsupials to evolve into different groups so sometimes uh, in some places in some different uh, ecological condition it produce umbat in another ecological condition it will produce kangaroo in here it is bandicoot native cat tasmanian wolf so whenever the same ancestral groups are situated at different ecological conditions so in different ecological conditions different environmental conditions different different environmental problems they have and thereby they solve those environmental problems in their own way so thereby producing different morphological characters so from the same ancestral with time different morphological characters appear and thereby appear different taxonomic levels of organisms which is called evolutionary divergence that means divergence of character divergence of forms appeared with time this divergence of characters is also observed by darwin when he visited the galapagos islands here in these islands darwin observed the finches and he found there are 14 species of finches and all these 14 species have different shape different size different types of beaks and according to darwin this difference of beak size and shape is due to different types of diets and habitats so these say for example these long narrow very uh, narrow beak these are particularly used to take food from the cactus type of plants whereas these sharp beaked uh, finch they use their beak to collect fruits from the uh, ground grasslands from the ground trees where there is no spines so you can see the change in morphology simply between these two finches where one finch have to collect its food have to collect the fruits from a, from the cactus type plants where there are lots of spines in the other type where the finches collect its food from ground trees ground grasslands similarly you can see that this large blunt stout type of beaks which particularly used to break the nuts nuts are the fruits which have the external shell is hard like the a coconut so uh, there are these kinds of uh, beaks also very narrow long narrow beak these are particularly used for um, having the insects from the tracks of tree trunks so for different diets for different food habits or for different food choices and uh, those fruits are collected from different areas from different habitats the same finches they developed different kinds of beak so again 
to solve different ecological problem to collect from different places different areas finches developed different kinds of beak so again divergence of character happened in the galapagos finches that means it is an example of evolutionary divergence another example of a bivalve which i already discussed what bivalve is the two same the two bivalves having the same lineage that means they are phylogenetically related and these two bivalves are bisected that means they are attached with the substrate by these kinds of bisal threads you can see these are the bisal threads by which they stuck with the bottom substrate here also these are the bisal threads by which they are stuck with the bottom substrate now the environmental condition or the habitat in which these two bivalves lives they are slightly different this bivalve is epiphonally bisally attached that means they lives above the substrate that is why they are known as epi bisect so epi means outer that is come from, coming from the epiphonal and bisect means bisally attached in contrast this bivalve is infonally bisally attached that is why it is known as endo bisect endo comes from infonal character that means it lives within the substrate inside the substrate inside the sediment cover in the underground and it is bisally attached so as the same phylogenetically related two different bival groups living in two different ecological conditions so you can see that their shape are also changed as this bival this epibiset form lives externally over the substrate so to provide better solution to this in uh, epiphonal form that means to live in a stable way above the substrate they have their bottom part which is in contact with the substrate more flattish and that is indicated by the maximum width line is most towards the bottom part you can see this is the this dotted line is the maximum line of maximum width that means this indicates the uh, center of gravity that means its center of gravity bring more towards the bottom part so that it becomes more stable and as it occurs epiphonally it requires stability so that with the wave it will not topple it will not be displaced from their host position but in contrast in the endobiset form which occurs infonally they occur within the substrate they occur inside the sediment cover so that is why their chance of toppling with waves is very very less so they they did not require to lower down their center of gravity so that is why in endobiset form you can see that the line of maximum width which is indicated by the center of gravity uh, position within this bivalve shell it is almost in the central part of its height it is far towards the upper portion you can see here it is here it is here it is so almost it is in the central portion or more towards the upper part for endobiset but for epibiset the line of maximum width which is an indicative of the position of center of gravity is more towards the bottom part of the shell which enhances its stability so to be the stable within the given environmental condition so that it will not displaced with the waves or any kinds of activity the organisms they will solve this problem in two, two different way one group they goes infonal so they have did not have to change their center of gravity and other group they remains epiphonal that means how 
above the substrate but they have to bring down their center of gravity more towards the bottom part so again solution of the problem in two different ways example of evolutionary divergence another example these bivalves are found in the coastal areas of eastern india and mostly in the coastal areas of odisha and andhra pradesh uh, here these two are bivalves are phylogenetically related but they are two different genus two different species you can see that when you can see remain in association with each other this point uh, if you read out this description you can find that this is the portion these are the number of bivalves these bivalve shells they are collected from those areas where these two bivalve genus or these two bivalve species and they lived in the same place that means they occur sympatric in sympatric association in association with each other that is together these two bivalve species they occur in same area in same place and in this case this species from a to d and for this species this q and r they occur allopatrically that means in some other areas this species occurs individually singly here it is not found this species is not found and in another place only this species is found this was not present if you compare the size and shape of these two species you can see that when these species occur sympatrically that means when these species occur together you can see that the size of these two species are almost same very close to each other but when they lives allopatrically if you compare this the size of this and the size of these you can see that there is a marked difference in sizes so when they occur sympatrically they are going to the same evolutionary direction to solve the problem that is they showing evolutionary convergence but when when they occur allopatrically they have their own individual way to provide the solutions that means evolutionary divergence another example of bivalve here you can see that this arca and anadara these are genus names and these two genus are phylogenetically related now they have their different habitat they have their different mode of life this one is infernal and this one is bisally attached this one is also infernal but bisally attached now you can see that both these infernal bivalves that is living within the substrate they occur at the sediment water interface that is just on the boundary between the substrate and the above lying water so that is why their posterior portion is flat so that means both these phylogenetically related species as they occur in the same environmental condition same ecological conditions they are providing the same solution so that is an example of evolutionary convergence in other case in this case the evolutionary convergence is within the same phylogenetic related groups in other case here this cardium and this anadara are phylogenetically unrelated group phylogenetically separated group but they lives in the same ecological condition same environmental condition that means in the sediment water interface and that means they live in the boundary between the substrate and the um, upper waters aqueous uh, condition so these two unrelated phylogenetically unrelated group 
as they occurs in the same ecological condition so they will also provide the same kinds of solutions and thereby uh, forming almost the same morphological feature you can see here also the posterior portion is flat here also the posterior portion is flat so again the same character development but he uh, here it occurs in two unrelated groups phylogenetic and unrelated groups but as these unrelated groups occur in same ecological conditions they provide same solutions by almost same way so again evolutionary convergence so here you can see evolutionary convergence in phylogenetically related groups in phylogenetically unrelated groups now depending on convergence and divergence of characters that means evolutionary convergence and divergence uh, there will be some appearance of organs now there are some organs which have their similar origin that means the origin is from the same way and the basic structure is also same but they perform different functions say for example the four limbs of horse and the four limbs of human so in our case our four limbs is used as hand so to grab to grab anything to hold anything but in case of horse or in case of bulls their four limb is used for a running apparatus they use them during their movement but in our case we did not use our hand or we did not use our four limb for movement from one place to another place so although the four limbs of human and horse or bull they appeared from the same basic structure from they appeared uh, from the same thing that means their origin is similar but in evolutionary time they have performed different functions so that is why they look slightly different so these kinds of organs are known as homologous organs and the property or character is known as homology so homologous organs are organs having same origin and same structure but performs different function in contrast there are certain organs in different organisms although they have their different origin and different basic structure just opposite of homologous organs they have different in origin and different basic structure but they perform the same function say for example the wings of bat and the wings of insects so in case of bat the wings is the modification of the its four limb whereas in case of wing insect the wings is the modification of its exoskeleton so although wings of bat and wings of uh, insect they are used for flying but their origin their structure is different so these are known as analogous organ and the property is known as analogy now the question comes or from all the previous discussions you can see that in all cases if an organism is trying to survive in a given environmental condition then it has to solve the problem in their own best possible way that means the organism must be adapted to that particular situation so if we consider this situation if we consider this darwin idea then there will be always the naturally selected best fitted form found within the nature that means evolution should be always perfect that means only the best fitted form only the well adapted form will be there found in the nature throughout the entire journey of life so as the question comes is evolution perfect no the answer is simply no evolution is never perfect there are lots of examples saying the imperfection of adaptation or imperfection of evolution one famous example is a trilobite trilobite is a arthropod group of organisms living in the 
paleozoic seas and at pt boundary permutator acid mass extinction boundary these marine arthropod groups are completely extinct so the famous example saying in favor of imperfection of adaptation is the trilobite eyes now if you consider the eyes of trilobite and the eyes of present day humans our eyes is composed of organic lenses whereas the lenses within the trilobite eyes here it is the eye of trilobite another eye of trilobite and you can see these are the lenses lots of small hexagonal lenses within the eye of trilobite the lenses of trilobites all the trilobites in the paleozoic time they are made of calcite crystals now a major problem of calcite is its high bidifringent character that means calcite so double refractive so you can imagine a trilobite living in the sea with high bidifringent always it observe a single object in a, with a double image so a single object is seen a single object was seen by a trilobite twice because of the double refraction because of the high birefringent character so it becomes a major problem that among these two image of one individual which one is original so they often get trapped in this visualization uh, imperfection so you can imagine that calcite lenses are not at all favorable for this marine group for this trilobite group of organisms but although these calcites are unfavorable to these trilobites but trilobites become one of the successful marine organisms found in the paleozoic seas and they live almost 300 million years time the entire paleozoic starting from the cambrian about 540 million years ago and ended at permo triassic boundary that is at 240 million years ago so they although their lenses are unfavorable to uh, them they see the um, double image of the same object but they live successfully within the marine condition for about 300 million years so it tells that for survival for survival of an organism it must not be always well adapted that means it is saying in favor of imperfection of adaptation so although an organism is not well adapted if it is well adapted then there should not be any calcite lens it will be uh, it will be uh some other types of lenses it will be lenses of some other materials but he they remained with their calcite lenses so they are not well adapted with their eye lenses so there are lots of imperfection of adaptation and most in most cases this imperfection of adaptation appears due to the due to an organism done different kinds of works with the same organ say for example the bird's beak it is used for collecting food it is used for feed the young it is used for grooming it is used for fending of rivals so all these purposes are done all these works all these functions are done by the same organ now adaptation says that 
one ecological problem is solved by one morphological character that means one organ but in nature we can see that several ecological problems are managed are solved by a single organ the famous example is is bird's beak it is used for grooming it is used for feed the young it is used for collecting food it is used for fighting with rivals so they are stuck within these different uh, ecological conditions so they are never the best fitted forms they always a uh, in between form for solving for fulfilling all these functions so that means beak of bivalve is not an well adapted morphology other examples are also there this one picture is a famous example of a deer this is an irish elk which is a type of deer now you can see that this deer has this large size horns and in the fossil record it was found that a this type of irish deer irish elk they have their height of about 2.1 meter whereas the span of this horn is about um, 3 or 3.4 meter 3 to 3.4 meter so you can see that the span of these uh, horns is greater than the height now you can imagine or you can visualize the weight of this horn if you compare the iris elk with the pre present day human body look at the difference in size so iris elk is almost double in size compared to a normal uh, human body compared to a almost 5 feet 10 or uh, 6 feet human so it is almost double in size and with this double in size they have these large horns now these large horns have a huge weight almost a ton or several tons in weight now remember imagine a organ organism imagine an animal or imagine yourself with this huge amount of weight over your head now this the horns of any deer is basically used to for prevention to protect them from their uh, rivals to protect them from their predators now here for irish elk this horn is come this la they did not require this large size horns which have a immense weight over their head but here this large size horns came as a by product with increasing size so as iris elk increase their body size so as a by product with the same rate of increasing of body size these horns also increase their size and they become so huge so again the horn is not a well adapted form the iris elk did not require this higher size this high uh, this large size horns but it came as a by product and it is also disadvantageous to them because uh, the horns not only used for preventing them from the uh, predators from their rivals but also different varieties of horns different patterns of horns they are also used to attract the female counterpart in the mating season now a irish elk with this much size of horns they become sometimes very dangerous sometimes become very fatal in the mating season for the female counterpart so during mating if the female counterparts came in contact with these large size heavy uh, horns they may often suffer death so because of this because 
of this disadvantage during mating season this iris elk have to discard their horns they have to discard these large amount of large size of horns in mating season so an organ developed an organ appeared not because of adaptation with some particular ecological condition but it came as a byproduct with increasing body size so again horn of and horn of irish elk is not an adaptive character you may all know this famous animal this is the panda which is a type of bear found in the southern china jungle now we all know that the food habit of bear is mainly carnivorous but this panda they have drastically changed their food habit from carnivorous to herbivorous food habit and they eat these bamboo shoots now the energy requirement for a bear group of organism is very high so if you compare a carnivorous uh, bear with respect to or in comparison to this herbivorous group of bears panda to fulfill the energy requirement by these pandas they have to eat about 20 hours within a day to fulfill their requirement because the energy what a bear get from the flesh of other animals is much higher compared to the energy panda acquire by eating this bamboo shoots so thereby to fulfill the energy requirement these kinds of bears they have to eat lots of lots of foods so almost within a 24 hours time of a day they use 20 hours simply for eating now if you look at the morphology of these pandas if you consider the morphology of the foot of all the bear group of organisms all the bears they have their fingers projecting forward all the foods because for bears their food is not used for grasping anything but they used their food during chase during running but in case of panda they have to grasp the bamboo shoot they have to catch the bamboo shoot they have to hold the bamboo shoot if you compare the foods of or fingers of a bear and if you compare the fingers uh, of a human being you can see that we have a opposable finger that is our thumb and with the help of this opposable finger with the help of this thumb we can hold we can grasp anything but a bear or a tiger as they have all their fingers projected in the same direction they cannot hold they cannot grasp anything now that becomes a problem for panda from their heredity from their phylogenetically they have all these fingers one two three four five all these fingers they are all projecting forward projecting in the same direction but as pandas are not carnivorous they are herbivorous and they eat the bamboo shoots so they have to grasp they have to grab they have to hold those bamboo shoots during eating now from the phylogenetical point of view all the fingers are projecting forward and they are not able to modify these five fingers into opposite direction such that they can grab the bamboo shoots instead they developed the radial sesamoid which is a wrist bone in an opposable direction so this radial sesamoid rs 
it is not at all a finger it is a wrist bone which is known as radial sesamoid they increase in size this radial sesamoid into opposable direction and therefore panda almost looks a hand or the four limbs having six fingers but this is this radial sesamoid is not at all a finger so the finger of all the fingers of panda they are projected forward and this character is uh, panda get this character phylogenetically from their ancestor they are not able to modify it but to survive in that ecological condition where they have to grab the bamboo shoots to eat they modify another bone so again it is the not best possible way it is the most well adapted form because if darwin adaptation concept is right is it is always true then adaptation should be perfect but here you can see it is not perfect if it was perfect then and li, uh, uh, finger should be oppositely projected but panda are not able to modify their fingers instead for providing some solutions to the problem they modify their rival sesamoid in the opposite direction so can they can solve the purpose so again the modified radial sesamoid which used as a opposable thumb in case of this uh, herbivorous group of bears these pandas it is not well adapted so again adaptation is not perfect and here is you can see a front cover of a book uh, written by one famous paleontologist stephen j gould on this topic that is the panda's thumb this one another example of imperfection of adaptation the mammalian skull we can see that in the skull of mammals there are lots of fractures there are lots of cracks so mammals uh, get this character they get this fractured skull from their ancestry from their evolutionary ancestry that is from the birds from the reptiles which need these cracks in their skull when they came out from the eggs they have to break their eggs and the young birds and reptiles they have to break their eggs and for escaping from the broken egg they required this uh, cracked or broken uh, skull but if you look at the um, birth process of a mammal compared to the birds and reptiles the process is entirely different a mammal came out from its mother by the vaginal path and there is no question of breaking egg breaking a hard cover from which the young juvenile came so the birth process of a bird or reptile and the birth process of a mammal is completely different but still from the phylogenetic angle from its evolutionary ancestor from birds and reptiles and as all the mammals evolved from birds and reptiles so this fractured skull remains within the mammals also so this fractured skull is not an adaptive character but mammals use this character during their come out from the narrow vaginal path it because of the presence of this fractured skull it becomes easy more easy to came out to coming out the juveniles to modify the um, skull shape during their birth so if morphology which is not appeared for this particular reason 
but later the organism used that morphology for a different reason say for example the wings of uh, birds or the feather of birds so basically feather appeared in birds to regulate their body temperature to maintain their body temperature but later birds use their feather as a flying apparatus so again feather is not an adaptive character feather is not coming to solve the flying problem feather is there for regulating the body temperature for maintaining the body temperature so the morphology feather is come for a different reason but the organism the bird use them for an other reason for flying so again evolution or adaptation is not perfect now from all this point of view what darwin said that the form or morphology of an organism is depend on the adaptive property of the organism that means depends on the adaptation so depending on adaptation depending on the ability of an organism to solve any particular ecological problem they have to develop certain organs certain morphology to particularly solve that problem so that the organism becomes well adapted so the morphology or the form the appearance of an organism the look of an organism according to darwin is depend on adaptation property but it was found in nature that it is not always the adaptation which guides the form which guides the looks of an organism but along with adaptation there are other things also which guides or which decides the form of an organism these are growth and phylogenetic so the famous example of growth is the horns of irish elk the famous example of phylogeny is the uh, suture in mammalian skull is the fractures in mammalian skull so together these three characters phylogeny growth and adaptation together these three will determine how an organism looks like what will be the form of an organism so these three factors controlling the morphology and this is the modified version of darwin evolution adaptation theory that is the organism may not be well adapted may not be best fit to survive a less adaptive form may also survive and for that the form of an organism the morphology of an organism is not only depend on the adaptation but it will depend on growth and phylogeny and this was proposed in 1972 by adolf zeilecker this triangle picture was given by adolf zeilecker and according to his name this triangle is known as zeilecker's triangle so you can get the idea that yes adaptation plays a vital role in determining the morphology in determining the journey path towards the uh, best possible way for an organism to sustain in the given ecological condition but it is not always adaptation which determines the morphology which determines the form of an organism thank you